tonight I'm going to tell you a remarkable story. It is remarkable for a number of reasons. The usurpation attempt of John Komnenos is probably the event in the history of Byzantium for which the greatest number of contemporary accounts has survived, five. The number of accounts is striking, especially given the coup's lack of success. But other noteworthy aspects of the event can be mentioned. We know the day and month of the coup, 31st of July, but until recently, the year was not established. Was it 1200? Was it 1201? Another out of the ordinary aspect of the usurpation attempt is the physical description of the usurper. He was fat. Every possible Greek adjective and synonym is used to express and describe John's fatness. Every one of the five accounts manages to impress on listeners and readers this salient characteristic of the usurper. Furthermore, we learn other things we did not know about Constantinople and the Great Palace. What the imperial mint workers did. What relics were kept in the Pharos Chapel of the palace. But to quote the Byzantine historian Michael Engold, hard facts are lacking, by which I suppose he means we do not know the names of John's co-conspirators. The bare outline of the story is this. John Komnenos, with his co-conspirators, went first to Hagia Sophia. And they need it. OK. There, he crowned himself with one of the crowns hanging over the altar table. He then broke into the great palace through a gate at the Hippodrome, avoiding the Chalki Gate and the Varangian guards there. The emperor, Alexius III Angelos, who was in the Vlachernai Palace at the other end of the city, sent relatives, including his son-in-law, Alexios Paleologos, to put down the conspiracy. John Komnenos was brutally killed and his co-conspirators imprisoned. John had been king for one day, from dawn of the 31st of July to dawn of the 1st of August. Of the five contemporary accounts, three are orations addressed to the Emperor Alexius III by Nikitas Khoniatis, Nikiforos Chrysoveris, and Ephemios Tornikis. To these orations can be added Khoniatis' account in his history and one eyewitness account by Nicholas Mazaritis. His Logos Afigimatikos, or narrative account of the event, may have been written shortly after the 31st of July, a date only he supplies. He gives no indication of his time of writing. Two of the three orations can be dated to several months after the event, 14th September and 6th January. Khonyati's oration may be the closest in time to the coup. In terms of the story they tell, Khonyati's history and Mezaritis' narrative are closest, although their perspectives differ. Khonyatis was outside the palace in the city and reported the actions of the mob and the route that the emperor's troops took to reach the scene of the coup at the Hippodrome and Great Palace. Mesaritis, on the other hand, reports the coup from a perspective inside the palace. It is Mesaritis' narrative that is the subject of this talk. Nicholas Mesaritis' life and work straddle the 12th and 13th centuries, divided into a before and after by the events of 1204, the capture of Constantinople by the Crusaders. Born in Constantinople in the reign of Manuel I Komnenos in the 1160s, he died sometime in the early decades of the 13th century as a subject of a Lascaris emperor in Asia Minor, either Theodore I or his son-in-law John III. The eighth child of his parents, he obtained an education in the capital. His father held a high position at court. 
References in his writings and in the titles of his works help us to piece together his career. He, mentioned that he, he mentions that he was a vivascalos, teaching in Constantinople before 1204. In 1200, at the time of the usurpation, he was skevophylax, or keeper of the sacred treasury of the great palace churches. In 1208, he is attested as deacon and referendarius of the church. By 1213, he was metropolitan of Ephesus and exarch of all Asia, the culmination of his career. The last surviving text associated with him, a synodal act, dates to 1216. He died at some undetermined time after that date. Mesaritis is one of the authors who lived and worked across the 1204 divide, who tells us specific things about Byzantium that we would otherwise never know. He gives names of places and things, describes buildings and their decoration. Mesaritis provides knowledge of daily life. He tells us that some Byzantines had their skin tattooed that the great palace had a building called the Mukrutas with a Mukarnas ceiling, that the Pharos chapel was dedicated to the virgin Ikokira, mistress of the house, and contained 10 passion relics which he names. For us modern readers, Mesaritis is wonderfully informative, even if some of this information is not without problems of interpretation. His account of the usurpation of John Komnenos shows the same traits as his other writing. He begins by giving the circumstances in which he wrote. I will tell you why and for whom I wrote my narrative. In his introduction, he includes some of the th same themes one finds in histories. He wrote because his acquaintances and others had asked him to write. This statement is reminiscent of John Zonaras' 12th century preface to his chronicle. Another theme Mesaritis shares with other writers um, is the following. He will write down all he saw so that the passage of time does not erase it from his memory. His emphasis is on eyewitness status. He continues by meticulously making a distinction between what he knows from his own presence and observation and what others told him. He identifies one of his informants, disclaiming responsibility for what he heard from him while vouching for the truth of his own narrative. What you hear from me now on, you can believe. Yet, all this careful work is undermined at the very beginning from his very first sentence, where he states, quote, in composing a narrative, most people who are deep thinking and resourceful, combine true events, tes alithies, with inventions, anaplasmata, that are appropriate to their purpose, making use of what is plausible. In this way, with this statement, Mazaristi sets up his readers or audience, introducing them to the narrative he is about to deliver. Truth and invention, the real thing and hearsay, what did Mesaritis prepare for his listeners? Like everything else he wrote, this piece of writing features him or his version of himself in it. Here as the Skevophylax, keeper of the treasures of the Pharos church. In his account, not only does he insert himself into the narrative, but he makes the whole event he relates revolve around him and his three adventures or encounters with those who were attempting to steal the treasures of the church. This fixation on his adventures is particularly intrusive when, after describing the brutal killing of John Komnenos by imperial troops, which we could, after all, expect to be the climax of the narrative, he returns to himself to tell us his third and final encounter with the would-be robbers. Mesaritis is therefore at the center of the action. The suspense for the reader-listener lies not in what will happen to the usurper, but in how events will unfold for the narrator. For, from the beginning, we know what will happen to John Komnenos. 
Mazaritis foreshadows the outcome six times in the first pages of the narrative, on each occasion in a different way. And I quote now, the one seeking to kill was killed. He was really going to his own death. He entered the palace of Hades and Pluto. His head hung down, a sign, it seemed to me, that it would not stay on his shoulders. While we know what will happen to John Komnenos, the dangers Mesaritis faces are still to come. When he arrives at the Pharos, he sees men armed with swords and knives. He addresses them in the only speech of the narrative. The would-be plunderers of the holy treasure are told, learn the names of the treasures here and tell the generations after you. Mesaritis proceeds to list and describe the passion relics of the Pharos, starting with the crown of thorns, 10 relics in all. His catalog is the only inventory of the relics that exists. It is a set piece that reads like a sermon on the central position of Constantinople, the New Jerusalem, in the Ecumeni. A version of the same speech is to be found in another of Mazariti's writings, his funeral oration for his brother John, written several years later in 1207. In that work, Nicholas puts the speech about the relics in his father's mouth, a father trying to persuade his son to stay in Constantinople and not to seek to live in Jerusalem. Mesaritis is very active, he shows us, in saving the treasure. But the person whom we might have expected to be at the center of the action and of the narrative, the usurper John, is the antithesis of active. Mesaritis calls him an actor, anthropos skinikos, and the palace, his stage, skini. But the few times he is mentioned by Mesaritis, he is always sitting at the beginning on the throne and at the end on the floor, and he has no lines to speak. From the time he gains entry into the great palace, John Komnenos is inert passive, motionless, and speechless. The only signs of life in him are his breath, short, and his sweat, profuse. The point is made extensively and explicitly in a series of alternating active and passive verbs that describe John, with the active verbs negative and the passive verbs positive. Being led, not leading, commanded, not commanding, receiving orders, not giving them, ruled, not ruling, mastered, not mastering, held under authority, not exercising authority, enslaved, not enslaving, fulfilling the command of everyone. The Skevophylax Nicholas first encountered him sitting on a throne in the Triclinos of Justinian. And you can see here, not perhaps, this area. Okay. I'm sorry that this map doesn't have the pharos, but it should be over here. He approached him from an untypical and unlikely perspective from behind. It is a view unique in Byzantine literature and extremely rare in Byzantine art. As Otto Demos remarked, Full back views do not occur at all in the classical period of Middle Byzantine art. For to the Byzantine beholder, such features, such figures would not be present at all. Mesaritis describes this non-presence so. Entering at the Triclinos of Justinian and gazing, I saw the head and the crown and the back of that new emperor. For my entrance to him was from the south, which prevented me from seeing his face. Coarse black hair, appropriate to his birth, coming down to him from his grandfather, shoulders soft and oversized, his back swollen and fleshy, a useless burden on that imperial throne, a projecting belly and paunch. Although Mesaritis approaches from the south, 
he supplements his view from the back with one from the front. The words progastora and prokilion, projecting belly, make explicit this other perspective. Mesaritis plays with perspective in his account. He could not be everywhere at once in the palace, but he describes all parts of the palace as if he were. Just as he gives multiple perspectives of John Cominos, so too he does for the interior of the palace. He gives a series of descriptions, a string of images that take his audience to different parts of the palace. The main verb is lacking, creating the effect of annotations for stage sets. And I quote, from this time on, the gates of the palace open and unguarded. The triclinos of Justinian denuded of men. The attack at the chrysotriclinos. The rush of soldiers here and there at the corners of the palace, cutting down those huddled in fear. Mazaritis combines visual with audio to give his audience the full theatrical effect. Voice and sound are frequently remarked upon by Mazaritis. The reason Mazaritis gives for writing his account in the first place was the loss of his voice. From shouting the entire day, my voice creaked and my breathing almost ceased and my vocal cords gave up. Since my voice was weakened and my throat was in a bad state, I was eager to transmit what I saw on paper and with ink. He gives other indications of his interest in sound and voice. When John Comnenos enters Hagia Sophia with his men, those inside realized that a revolt was underway from the gait of their feet and the rhythm of their speech, staccato and forced. A man Mesaritis encountered in the palace break-in, whom he calls a barbarian, had a rough voice he says. In another case, he recreates the bad syntax and grammar of a German who asks him in a threatening manner, Tina Kripti Foverotati Fiki Tisa Fiki Milia. Translated into English, the German's question would sound like this, what hides the awesome chest this treasures? Mesaritis' narrative supplies the storyline the account of the event, but it provides in addition the physical appearance of the characters, their bearing and clothing, the sound of their footsteps, voices, breathing, in short, their physical presence. This is theater in the round. By his attention to these physical details, he transports his audience, whether those listening to him or reading him, to the event itself. They inhabit it, its time and place. How the body functions and the effects on it of certain sounds, sights, and circumstances are key elements in Mezaritis reconstruction of events and the characters involved in them. He recreates all possible dimensions, including psychological states. His audience is told, the cry pierced through the oracle of my ear, the hair on my head stood up, and also the skin below. As he was speaking, dizziness overcame me, and trembling took hold of my limbs, and my hands and knees were paralyzed, and I perceived that I was practically without breath, when I put it in my mind that the wretches would reach the church of the Mother of God also, and plunder the holy things. In keeping with his interest in the body, and also in making lists of things, Mazaritis gives a full account of the parts of the body that were hit and wounded in the fighting on the 31st of July. I stood against the opponents who were hitting me again with an abundance of stones, which crushed the bones of my left hand, the shoulder, the forearm, the radius, and the fingers themselves. Another example in which he shows off his anatomical knowledge. One was hit on the ankle joint. Another was wounded on the metatarsis. Another was maltreated on the scaphoid. Another on the cuboid. Another received wounds on the heel, most sustained discomfort and lashes on the fibula. Having created a theater in the round, Mesaritis leads his audience to the final scene 
in the life of John Corninos. It is a silent one. John sits on the ground in the Mukrutas, a building in the Great Palace known by this name only from Mezariti's account. It was in this building that the usurper was found by the emperor's soldiers, according to Mezaritis. It was from the Mukhrutas that he was dragged down the stairs to the Triklinos of Justinian, where he was killed. He spent his last moments of life in this building. This is how Mezaritis describes it. The Mukhrutas is an enormous building adjacent to the Chrysotriklinos, lying as it does on the west side of the latter. It is, of course, whoop, sorry, not marked on the map. The steps leading up to it are made of baked brick, lime, and marble. The staircase, which is serrated on either side and turns in a circle, is colored blue, deep red, green, and purple by means of a medley of cut painted tiles of cruciform shape. This building is the work not of a Roman, nor a Sicilian, nor an Iberian, nor a Southern Italian, nor a Cypriot hand, but of a Persian hand, by virtue of which it contains images of Persians in different costumes. The canopy of the roof <coughs> consisting of hemispheres joined to the heaven-like ceiling, offers a variegated spectacle. Closely packed angles project inward and outward. The beauty of the carving is extraordinary, and wonderful is the appearance of the cavities, which, overlaid with gold, produce the effect of a rainbow more colorful than the one in the clouds. There is insatiable enjoyment here not hidden, but on the surface. Not only those who direct their gaze to these things for the first time, but those who have often done so are struck with wonder and astonishment. Indeed, this Persian building is more delightful than the Laconian one of Menelaos. Mezaritis continues his ephesus. The Persian stage, the work of a hand related on his grandfather's side, had the actor John crowned, but not arrayed imperially, sitting on the ground, a symbol, this, of the condition that had taken hold of the miserable one and of the unbearable nature of the misfortune. He was drinking much and acting agreeably to the Persians represented in the building and he was drinking to their health. Dripping with sweat, he sometimes wiped the sweat with a towel, sometimes flicked it away with the crook of his, fi of his finger. This passage has lately attracted a great deal of attention. Jeremy Johns, a historian of Norman Sicily, has compared the Mucarnas ceiling of the Mujrutas with the Capella Palatina in Palermo. And here you see the ceiling of the Capella Palatina. Whereas the name Mukhrutas had been interpreted until now as a Persian word meaning cone and referring to the conical roof of a Seljuk type pavilion, John gives an Arabic, John's gives an Arabic etymology for the word makrat meaning glass or stone that has been carved. The word occurs in Greek in a monastic foundation charter of the late 11th century, referring to drinking glasses, muhrutia, muhrutia potiria. Ptocho Prodromos in the 12th century vernacular works use, uses the uh, address to emperors, uses the word in the context of wine drinking. Thus, Jeremy Johns connects the Mukhrutas with its images of Persians, i.e. Turks, in different costumes with the images on the ceiling of the Capella Palatina, royal drinking parties, rulers with their 
So here's a close-up of the ceiling and another one and another one. And here we have the drinkers on the ceiling of the Capella Palatina. When we read, when we read the description of uh, Mezaritis, because we know of the Capella Palatina, we imagine him sitting on the floor under such a ceiling. John Komnenos was toasting similar figures in Constantinople. Mezaritis' description of the Mukhruta ceiling fits a wooden coffered Mukarna ceiling. Jeremy Johns goes further and identifies the Mukhrutas with Manuel Komnenos's building in the Great Palace, a hall described by Khonyatis as large and decorated with scenes of Manuel's victories. In that hall, Manuel presided over the Church Synod of 1166, and Michael IX Paleologos at the end of the 13th century made promotions there after his coronation. That is all we know of the so-called triclinos of Manuel, or the Manuelitis. Jeremy Johns suggests that the same artist decorated both the Capella Palatina and the Hall of Manuel, traveling from Sicily to Constantinople. But do we need to posit a Sicilian contribution to the Mukhrutas? Manuel I received the Sultan Kilij Aslan II in Constantinople in 1156 and spent lavishly on his reception. He could have built the Mukhrutas in his honor or redecorated an older building that already stood on the spot. The Lapsiakos has been suggested, which is, you can see here, right there. People think. Okay. Without excavation, how will we ever know? However, there are striking parallels of the Mukhrutas, as Misaritis describes it, and Seljuk tiles both in color and in shape. You remember the colors were described as red, green, blue, and porphyry. So here I show you some tiles, and you can pick out some of those colors there. Also, the cruciform shape of this tile. The evidence seems to me stronger for Seljuk influence than Norman Sicilian. We return to John Komnenos. Have I mentioned who he is? If you look in a study of the Komnenos family, you will find a number of Komnini called John by the end of the 12th century, the Komnini had intermarried with many other families. The number of people with this surname shows the success of Alexius I's strategy. Our John Komnenos is distinguished from the others by his nickname, Opahis, the Fat. But who is he? Did I mention that he is the grandson of a Turk? His grandfather was John Aksuch, a Seljuk Turk taken hostage by the Crusaders when they captured Nicaea on the First Crusade. They gave John Aksuch to the Emperor Alexius as a gift. Alexius Komnenos had him raised in the palace alongside his son John, his heir, and the two boys became close companions and friends. John Aksuch held the important and prestigious title of Megas Domesticos. We learn that when relations of the emperor encountered the Megas Domesticos on the road, they would dismount and pay their respects to him in proskinesis. John was so highly regarded that his son Alexius, the Protostrator, another high military title, was married to the granddaughter of the emperor John II, Maria Komnini. 
Our John Komnenos the Fat was the offspring of this marriage. He appears only as Komnenos in sources and as the Pan Sevastos Sevastos, honorific titles given to the emperor's in-laws. Therefore, our John Komnenos came from an aristocratic family. Why and how are his Tur Turkish origins important in the coup? Mezaritis first hints at them when he describes John from behind. Coarse black hair, appropriate to his birth, coming down to him from his grandfather. His only other reference to John's Turkish origins is in his description of the building of the Muhrutas, the work of, quote, someone related on his grandfather's side. In the accounts of the other authors who wrote about the coup, John's Turkish ancestry is much more pronounced and is a source of denunciation. Once a Turk, always a Turk, says Ephemio Stornikis of John Komnenos in his oration to the Emperor Alexius III, against whom the coup had been mounted. Mesaritis does not make such statements, yet he presents an overweight, perspiring John, a desperate figure sitting on the floor under a mukarna ceiling toasting the Turkish figures around him. Note that he does not say where in the building the figures were represented. They could have been on the walls and not as in the Capella Palatina on the ceiling. Note too that Mesaritis does not say John was drinking wine. He may have been toasting the wine imbibing Turks in the building with water. Cognati states that John was drinking water in the course of the coup. He was blowing like a dolphin and emptying whole barrels of water, overcome by thirst as he was corpulent. He boiled off the sweat, which ran in streams and evaporated while still warm. By the 14th century, when Ephraim of Enos wrote his verse chronicle, the water of Cognatis had become wine. And, needless to say, modern authors all say Mesaritis was drinking wine. Did John Komnenos really spend the last moments of his life on the floor of the Mukrutas? Is this Persian stage, as Mesaritis calls it, truth or invention? We will never know. No other author mentions the building in connection with the coup or in any other context. Yet for us modern readers, as well as Mezaritis contemporaries, the Persian stage was a sitting, setting of poetic justice for this grandson of a Turk. As Mezaritis himself says at the beginning of his oration or his speech, Deep thinking and resourceful people combine true events with inventions that are appropriate to their purpose. In my reading of Mesaritis, the author is not so much, sorry, yes, not so much denouncing or ridiculing John Komnenos as showing compassion for the man who had been the puppet of others, a man who was more at home in the Mukhrutas than on the throne in the Triklinos of Justinian. To return to the question why there are so many versions of this usurpation, when all is said and done, John Komnenos had a much stronger and better claim to the throne than the emperor who inhabited it, Alexius III. John Komnenos was the grandson of a born in the purple, firstborn son of the Emperor John. Things might have turned out differently, and Byzantium would then have had an emperor of Turkish ancestry. Thank you. Uh, if, does anyone have any questions? I would be very happy to discuss your views on this whole matter. If you'll excuse me, I have to put my sunglasses on to see you properly. I would like to ask about Mesaritis' uh, career. Do we know what like, his exact position in the palace was before the oration and after that? For example, do you know if he got a promotion after that oration? 
We don't know anything about it, no. Um, he's Scevophylax and Deacon, and then he is uh, in Asia Minor the next time we hear about what he does, what he is, what he's doing. He's referendarios, I think, in Asia Minor before he becomes metropolitan. Sorry, we don't know. And it's not addressed to the emperor, this, or, this oration, or this speech, or whatever we want to call it, this account. The emperor is not addressed unlike the other orations, where there is much stronger emphasis on uh, the Turkishness of uh, John Komnenos and the absurdity of his attempt. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any alternating use of the term Turkos, a per a per per a Turkish and Persian for, for, for describing John, or it's just like only Persian? Version. Um, he doesn't use the word barbarian of Persians. He only uses it of some of the soldiers who were uh, guarding the palace, who were from foreign backgrounds, like Germans or Varangians, that kind of thing. Not Varangians, but the German in particular, who was actually protecting the palace, except that he wanted to rob, according to Mazaritis, the treasures of the Pharos. So he calls him a barbarian. He calls the foreign troops barbarians, but he doesn't call Persians barbarians. And the, uh, the only places where he talks of Persians are the ones I mentioned. Yeah. Um, so you said that he had black hair and he was fat. So apparently there's an ideal type of emperor, like blonde hair. How, what, what was it? What was the ideal physical feature of an emperor? Uh, there's a book on, um, what's it, or an article on beauty by somebody. Uh, uh, well, anyway, the point is that have you ever heard of a fat emperor in Byzantium? We don't hear. There must have been people who were not exactly slim, but we don't hear about it. I, th my point here is that. Uh, a, it's a distinguishing characteristic to call him the fat because there were so many John Komnini in the world at the time. Yeah. And B, um, that because he failed, he's John Komninos the fat. He, uh, because he failed, he's a Turk. Otherwise, no one would mention it. Uh, and another mm -hmm. thing about black hair is that in like, um, the Muslims, uh, they were calling the Byzantines Dama Asfar, meaning blonde people. So, um, but like there were Armenian origin emperors. Uh, but even in later times, they were calling it Dama Asfar. So, I mean, I was wondering if, what, I mean, in the Byzantine mentality, is there this ideal, was there this ideal beauty and that emperor should? Uh, well, I think it wasn't so much that it was black hair as that it was coarse. Uh, and secondly, I don't personally remember having read any descriptions of emperors apart from um, their height might be mentioned um, or, uh, yeah, their height, basically. So I don't remember color of hair or anything like that. In one case, I think Theodolaskis is said to have uh, two different eye colors. Mm. But I think they were Wh which is uh, white skin, at least. Like, and it begins at Vitas when he was praising the Emir, he said he wasn't light, black, light. but mm -hmm. white. Yes, so yes. They yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you think this is a deliberate silence? 
nobody mentions who they are. Yeah, they're important people. That's a problem for the emperor. So they're important people. Uh, Mezaritis, you wouldn't even know. I think there's one half a sentence where he's, or half a breath, he says, and the, and the conspirators. But he puts great emphasis on the mob, on the crowd that joined in because they thought they could get something out of it. So they're robbing their, uh, the emperor's troops could not go through the messy. Uh, they had to take boats to come around um, because there was so much uh, looting going on in the center of the city. So he knew, you think, but it's a, he deliberately doesn't tell us. I mean, he knew who the conspirators were then. He was he just... No, he wouldn't name them, no. He wouldn't name them, so... Mm -mm. Is he one of them? Was he secretly on, in favor? Well, but he Has seems to try to de de legitimize him with these descriptions, so I would doubt that. Yeah, yeah. If he'd won, maybe not. <laughs> the mystery. Because um, this has been pointed out that the first thing he does is go to talk to John Komnenos and say, can I have some men to protect the Pharos chapel? He goes straight up to him. <coughs> Nobody stops him. In fact, the, the bodyguard actually helps him onto the platform on which the throne is. And he talks to him and he says, John doesn't say anything or he kind of says, oh, I don't have any men, you know, <laughs> go away. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> um, it's generally described uh, as uh, the houses of the rich are being looted. The people are completely out of control. But, uh, yeah. And then after um, Comunios uh, was um, executed, the head was exhibited where and the body was taken back to the palace? Um, the head was hung from at the Agora, mm -hmm. and the body was taken to the Vlacherna, and uh, Alexius is said by Cognatis to hang out of the window or the balcony and look down at the body. Um, uh, but no. you don't have any evidence for the, the description of the Damnatio itself, the, the procession of the head or the body? No, it's not mentioned at all that there was a procession. But his body is, is described in a beast-like way, that it's, it's like a, it's an, an ox or something like that. It's very demeaning, the way it's described. Does anyone have any views on the, um, the Muhrutas, whether it could be uh, Seljuk or Sicilian? Yeah, it seems kind of evident, but not to Jeremy Jones. Yeah. What exactly makes Jeremy? Yeah. In fact, I was curious to know what exactly makes Jeremy Johnson think that the Norman uh, Sicilian and some people from Sicily came around to Constantinople to build it. He has no evidence. It's just that he thinks from the description of Mazaritis. And if I may say something slightly wicked, um, uh, er <clears throat> two people who have written about it take that description, which is already translated by Mango, and they take it out of context. They haven't read the whole text, in my, I think, because it wasn't translated till a few months ago <clears throat> by Michael Engold. So I don't think they have the 
again, excuse me, the confidence to read the whole text. And they take, so they take the description, and it says that there are people dressed in costumes, Persians. Doesn't say where. They have, don't seem to have noticed that. They could be on the walls, in which case the parallel is a little weakened. Um, since the date of the uh, construction or elevation of this hall in Constantinople is unknown, perhaps it can also be the other way around. Exactly, because we know that Roger II of Sicily imitated Byzantine emperors. Exactly, and it's, always, ah. it's usually the other way around. That yeah, east to west, not west to east. There's a big tendency, to, I think you will have noticed in your work, to say things come from the West. Mm -hmm. And maybe they do, but maybe they don't. I think the same question stands for the ninth century of Eros. Yeah. So this palace is Gira, so called palace. Yeah. And I wonder if uh, art historians here might be more, you know, might be thinking about this more, but do we really have to choose between the Norman and the Persian? Because by the 11th, 12th centuries, there's this shared culture of, you know, like a very barbarian uh, way of saying it. Uh, like, uh, maybe the, the, it's a speculation, sheer speculation, but the, the palace itself looks both like a Sicilian and a Persian palace because the Byzantines had the liberty, probably, they thought they had the liberty to choose all these styles and mix and match them together. So, uh, I don't have an answer, or, uh, but is, is there a third possibility? Well, my big question is, and it's nice to have an audience to put it to, uh, in uh, the Capella Palatina, that is both a throne room and a chapel, a church. Uh, so Roger was sitting at the west end uh, uh, on his throne, and the whole ceiling uh, that he's sitting under, and, that the, and the, uh, there are mosaics all around, of the um, New Testament uh, stories. Wait a minute, let me go back. Uh, so what is, um, you might say, well, how can he sit under such a, a ceiling with all these um, Persian, whatever you want to call them, figures in a church? You see the, you see the walls here? These are all mosaics. Uh, but it was suggested to me that they are so high up that you can't actually make out the, the figures. Um, they're not just drinking, there are animals there, they're playing musical instruments. Um, so if you can't see them, then I don't suppose it's very profane, and you can't say it's profaning the, the church. Um, but by the same token, uh, Manuel, if this is Manuel's triclinos, that these, the muhrutas is the same as his triclinos, he held a synod there so, uh, and he's got um, images of his own hunting, so, uh, not hunting, what am I saying? His um, victories. So he's mixing, right? If you can have, hold a synod in this room and you have uh, secular images, maybe I'm making too much of a distinction. Um, so I suppose you could also have images of Persians drinking, etc., in the same room. But did the author tra travel a lot? The author? As a recess? Uh, did he go to the, the Celtic stay to Italy? No, not that we know of. Because no. maybe he saw it somewhere and he put it as a fictional room to be able to pass his message. I don't think he makes up things that, like he didn't make up the name Muhrutas. It might be the popular name for the building. Maybe it has another name. Um, Jeremy Johns thinks that he uh, made it up. Uh, he doesn't make, he, real things are real. Like this is a real building. He doesn't make up the building. I don't think he makes up the decoration. What he might have made up, I have a feeling for that from reading his other work, is um, saying that John was in that building before he died. Because uh, how does he know? He wasn't there, right? He was supposedly at the Pharos, protecting the Pharos. Or was he? So it brings up the whole question. For me, what's interesting also is what is an eyewitness account? How important is, or how secure is an eyewitness account? We know from battle scenes that are described 
by people who are eyewitnesses because they're present, but you cannot be present everywhere at the same time. So what kind of a value does an eyewitness account have? So. Behind you, yes. It's also a wonderful last remark. You know, maybe he's also combining different rhetorical <coughs> exercises into that oration. He has the oration, he has the narration technique, he has maybe like the thesis and the antithesis in some way. He has aktasis. So maybe in some ways he's trying to test the reader and the listener too. You know, he claims that what he's saying is actually the truth, but in the very beginning he undermines it. So maybe it's some sort of rhetorical display of wit as well. Sure, definitely that. <coughs> I agree with you. So, um, I was wondering whether we know his relation to Alexios Komnenos, the one who went to Trabzon in 1204, and I was wondering whether um, as a member of the communion um, dynasty, um, what was the power politics um, at that time when he usurped the throne for one day? Very good questions, but I don't know the answer. And I don't know if anybody does, if we have enough evidence, knowledge of it. One thing I, should have, I could also mention is that there's a marginal note that says that Alexios Mudzuklos, Alexios V, was um, behind it. And, uh, that, and we know that Alexios was imprisoned at some point, and he was released when uh, Isaac II and his son um, Alexios the, what was he, the fourth, came to the throne when the Crusaders were present. Alexius V becomes the emperor because he kills Alexius IV. So um, it could be that uh, Muzuflos is part of this conspiracy. Alexius Dukas Muzuflos, another nickname that became a surname. But he's never became a surname, I guess we're glad of that. <laughs> I just had a follow-up to what the Korai said earlier about the art historians and um, the Jeremy Jones has been mentioned, but I also want to mention Alicia Walker, who's written about this, uh -huh. and has mentioned the, um, the Seljuk and, um, and what we call Persian incarnation. But uh, in terms of what uh, Korai said, the kind of shared um, aesthetic uh -huh. and Gravarian, uh, that has also been uh, mentioned, uh, I mean, has been um, uh, written previously by, I think it was Lucian Hans and Scott uh -huh. Bedford, uh, especially in relation to palace architecture, how there was um, this international style, and uh, so connecting the Capella Palatina and the Nukitas. Um, but I'm very interested to hear about your. Um, you know, your textual reading and how it elaborates on what has been said before, because I think that can help us kind of connect some of these uh, dots um, that have been connected perhaps more loosely on stylistic grounds. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's really wonderful to see more kind of textual uh, evidence. Thanks. Yeah, Alicia Walker, um she says that uh, the whole the Muhruta scene uh, shows how um, John Komnenos was unworthy of the throne because uh, you know the emperor sits under the image of Christ and he's sitting under the image of these uh, what should we say uh, Persians in you know drinking wine. Um, I don't. I, I mean, I. I agree that he is shown in an unworthy light, but that is not the only place and not the only way. And um, also, I think that Mazaritis shows real feeling for him, in a sense. Not, he's not, you know, he's not just saying this man is worthless. 
um, but that's not something you can prove. It's a feeling that I have from reading the text. Um, and besides, we don't know that he was sitting under these people. He might, they might just be all around him. And he isn't a drunkard, in my opinion. He's drinking water. Um, but maybe Mazaritis wants us to fill in the gaps. He's toasting, therefore he's drinking wine. You know, there, there are all sorts of things going on here. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Well, if that, is that everything? Any other questions? I feel like I'm conducting a class here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your uh, comments and suggestions. And it's work in progress. And uh, Scott Redford definitely, um, you know, is of this opinion as well. So I hope that uh, he and I can develop this further and maybe publish something. But now that the whole of Mesaditi's work has been translated into English by Michael Engold, it might become more uh, popular with people. Uh, although I disagree fundamentally with lots of things he says in his translation. For example, he says that he's drinking wine. He just supplies the word wine. It's not in the Greek. So, Vida. A warning. <laughs> Don't trust everything you read. <laughs>